Okay, hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for DDU Teaching. Um, and we're going to just focus on transesophageal echo for this next half an hour, 45 minutes or so. Um, I'll please just chime in if you've got any questions. I'll start off at a relatively slow pace and try and pick it up and get more and more advanced. Um, there will be, in terms of the exam, there will be questions in advanced ultrasound exams on tow. There always is. I don't know too many advanced qualifications other than sort of the American Echo Board exams where you don't have toe in it at all for advanced critical care echo. So it is an important thing to learn even if you're not doing an awful lot. Uh, so I'll try and take you through things as best I can. I'm going to try and use our echo simulator, Bob. So excuse me while I just try and switch over so that it'll all be done on the computer on my left and we'll go from there. So just hang on a second, okay? How are we going? Can everyone, can everyone hear me? Yeah, great, yeah. If you, uh, it's great if you can hear me. Tell me if you need me to change any of the sound or anything uh, and we'll try and uh, try and go from there, all right? All right, so everyone, this is Bob. Bob, this is everyone. Um, and we'll just go through how to do an ordinary toe and I'll try and, uh, as long as you can all see my screen there, we'll take you through a few tips and tricks as we go. And obviously starting with some basic stuff, so I know there are a few of you who have not done any toe at all, and then there are some of you who are obviously extremely advanced, so we'll just use your stuff, we'll try and cover all bases, all right? Um, okay, so toe probe. Got, so have you got the handle of the toe probe, we've got the tip of our toe probe, and on the tip of our toe probe, I don't know if you can see this properly, but there's a little flat section in there, and the flat section is where the ultrasound waves come out, and they can be done in such a way so that First thing I can change, can you all see my mouse on the screen? Is that okay? Can you all see my mouse up on the top screen? Is that okay? All right, so yep. up here you can see the omniplane as we call it, and that's uh, operated by the two buttons that we have on the screen here. So if I press one, it goes up, and if I press the other, it goes down. And that essentially brings out the wave, uh, the sound wave, and it, it rotates it around. All right? Um, the next things that we've got on the handle are the two big buttons. Um, I'll try and uh, if I can say this properly with uh, on the screen. So if I turn one button, it does some anti-flexion, and if I go the other way, it does the retroflexion. I've got to be honest; I always forget exactly which way is which in terms of turning the probe. So the way that I always start off is I'm holding the probe in my hand. I have the flat section, which is where the sound waves are coming out, pointing down towards the patient. I'm holding my hand. I make sure that I, I can see which way the probe is going up and down with my other hand rotating the probe. The little probe on the top is what moves the probe left and right. And I'll try and demonstrate all of that when I stick it in Bob. Um, the last movement that's really important is about rotation. And I'll show it again when I put the probe in. And for the rotation to be important, it's important to have your hands uh, sort of stretched apart, just like you're doing a bronc. And that means that small little movements of your hand have movements at the other end rather than if your hands are close together and I turn it, it doesn't really turn at all. So I'll try and demonstrate some of that now as we go in, okay? So uh, maybe I'll talk about inserting the probe in just a second, all right? So when you're putting the probe in, oh, sorry guys, I might have to restart Bob. He doesn't look that happy, does he? Sorry guys, one second. Yeah. I just take away the heart, oh, sorry, take away the bone so that we can see it on here. Okay, so as we insert the probe, you can see is I can push the probe in and out. 
And you'll notice as I put, first thing to notice is looking at the screen on the, on the right, is as I push the probe in, you'll notice that the esophagus is not just a linear structure. And look at the plane of interrogation as I come down. So I'll just pull it back up again. That's sort of down that, you know, the mid esophageal four chamber, what you talk about. And you can see that's sort of down the long axis of the heart. As you push it down a little bit further, the esophagus curves underneath the left, uh, underneath the left ventricle. And that's how we get sort of our short axis view. So that the, the curve of the esophagus is around underneath the heart. Okay, so that's obviously the movement up and down, pushing that probe in. And that line of interrogation moves from being longitudinal into more of a short axis view. Okay, so that's the first movement. Second movement is this twisting movement. And if you look at my hand, as I twist it, I move in that plane of sort of interrogation, moving that heart from one side to the other. And that's moving my hand sort of clockwise, moves it over to the patient's right, anti-clockwise moves it to the patient's left. All right. I'll just show it again a different angle. So as I wrote it clockwise, it looks over to the patient's right, and that right ventricle comes into sort of the center of the screen. I move it left, and that left ventricle slides across to the other side of the screen. So that's sort of in-plane motion. The next thing would be, let's just show you the rotation from this. So if I have something in the middle of my screen on one view, and I rotate the omniplane, it stays in the middle of my screen, and that's how I go from being in a four-chamber view up to a two-chamber view. And if I carry on spinning around to 120 or so, I'll get the three chamber view. And that's, I always think about that, it's a bit the same as if I start at the beginning again. That's the same as if I was in my apical four chamber view in transthoracic. I put the LV into the middle of the screen. I rotate around sort of 60 degrees up to 90 with toe, and you get your two chamber view. And then I carry on going around to 120, and I have my three chamber view or apical long axis view. And I'm gonna ask Lewis in a second what all those walls are on that, on that as we go. Fantastic, okay. Next thing I'll show you, the anti-flexion and retroflexion. And it's, uh, so often when you're doing it in a real patient, you sort of come down to get the four chamber view. We talk about needing a little bit of retroflexion. You can just see with that angle of interrogation, just sort of angling a little bit further down, it makes that heart, I lose that aortic valve and it makes the heart sort of look long and thin. And that's trying to find the sort of the perfect long axis of the heart. So that's where retroflexion is particularly useful, just to angle down and have a look at that long axis of the heart. I, I hope that you can see that on that image on the left. So a little bit of retroflexion gets a better view down the apical four chamber, uh, down the mid esophageal four chamber view. Antiflexion can be particularly useful when we're doing like the deep gastric view, okay? So if I just pass it deep, deep, deep into the heart, and I'll talk about this in a bit more detail. If I want to look back up at the heart, I've got to do full anti-flexion. And, and Bob's not magic at this, but if you do so full anti-flexion, that gives you a chance to look back up at the heart, trying to find a apical, uh, trying to find that five chamber view, all right? So that's full anti-flexion, bending it back up and looking at the deep gastric view. All right, so that's the anti-flexion and retroflexion. And the last one I don't use that much, I gotta be honest, which is just the looking left and looking right. Uh, it doesn't show up particularly well. So I'll see if I can find a better view where it's not stuck to do it. If I just move that button left and I move it right, you just get that idea of that plane sort of rocking one way or the other. Okay, so there are not that many movements in transesophageal echo, which means that it's not that, uh, you know, sometimes you can't sort of get off axis imaging or something, but we can move the probe in and out. We can rotate it left and right. We can do some anti-flexion and we can do some retroflexion. And then we've got the omniplane. And then if you want to get fancy, we just can move that probe a little bit left and a little bit right. And I'll show you where that's useful in just a second, okay? So those are the basic movements that we've got at our disposal. Um, any questions so far, is everyone okay? All right, putting the probe into the patient, um, it's a little different if the patient's awake or asleep, but if the patient's awake uh, or you know, semi-sedated, using local anesthetic in the mouth, I have the probe that I kind of follow along the hard palate. I then do a bit of anti-flexion till I hit the soft palate, 
I go into their, uh, so just above their, their larynx, I then relax it or a little bit of retroflexion and then try and insert it. I don't think it shows up brilliantly on Bob because I'm trying to do this, but we'll see how we go, okay? So putting that probe in. So putting that probe in, I do a little bit of retroflexion first of all. I hit the back of the um, hard palate. I do some anti-flexion. Uh, anti I insert it in till I start hitting the, uh, start hitting sort of the, a bit of resistance at the top of the larynx. Then I do a little bit of retroflexion to try and snake it down and in. So sort of following it up, round, and back round again in sort of like a big S shape. If you're doing it on an intubated patient, um, I, I try and have the head in completely the wrong position that you'd have to intubate someone. So completely sort of neck folded down forwards. Uh, and that means that, you know, hopefully the, the trachea is sort of way out of the way. And, the, and that means it will help your mo mo movement. So having the patient in the, in the worst position for intubation is the best for sticking a transesophageal down. I find it essential you've got to have a laryngoscope nearby because if you can't put the probe in, sometimes you just look with the laryngoscope and you can lift the, the larynx and epiglottis up out of the way and you can actually see where you're inserting your probe. Um, so if you've got your laryngoscope there, I often find you don't need to use it. So it's kind of wards off evil spirits, I guess. All right. Um, well, let's talk about the we'll talk about the procedure that I follow. Um, there are different ways of doing this. It doesn't matter what order you do it in, but for me, it's about trying to minimize movement. So the big thing that we get worried about is, of course, esophageal damage. Um, esophageal damage is most likely to occur if uh, the person who's doing the procedure hasn't done a lot of these things. So if you are sticking them down for the first time, just do it with a bit of supervision, I think is the go. And esophageal injuries, particularly in our institution in the last 10 years, have been caused by people who are learning. So just be careful, and the rule is if you feel some resistance, don't force it, okay? So, yeah, so the, the most experienced user ideally should be putting it in. There's people who are at risk are people who've had previous operations or cancer uh, uh, or any kind of uh, surgery around that area. The if they're on steroids for long term or they're on bisphosphonates for some reason. I still haven't quite figured out why bisphosphonates is such a big deal, but they are. Um, and if they're over the age of 80. So those are sort of the risk factors that should get your spidey sense going. And if you have problems, don't force it. Okay. So the way I do it, this is not perfect, but it's just the way I do it to try and minimize movement in and out. So I start off with my deep gastric view. I then work up to the sort of upper esophageal view. I then turn around and I have a look at the esophagus uh, to look at the aorta. And then I actually insert the probe back down following that aorta. And then I take pictures of it coming all the way up. So I should only be inserting the probe once, pulling it out, imaging, turn it around, push it in, and then pull it out again. So it's sort of two movements rather than sort of going up and down lots and lots and lots. So first things first, I go for my deep gastric. And the, the tip and trick I've got for doing the deep gastric is I, I find my short axis view that we can see here. Okay, so this is like a short axis that we'd see in, uh, sorry, it's like a short gastric that we'd see in transesophageal in our short axis view. I keep on advancing the probe. So I keep pushing it in, keep pushing it in, keep pushing it in until I don't see anything anymore. And I know that I'm deep in the stomach. And then I do full anti-flexion, still not trying to pick up anything, and then slowly I pull back. And Bob's a little tricky to do this on, I find sometimes. And then I pull back, trying to get it to touch that, uh, to touch the front of the heart. And that's how you get this kind of picture, okay? So this is known as the deep gastric view, and it's a bit like a apical five chamber view, okay? And the reason why we like that is it gives us the best Doppler angle of, I'm sorry, I've got to relax my hand a little bit. It gives us our best angle for having a look down through the, so I'm just going to put the anti-flexion back on. And that gives us the best Doppler angle of looking down through that aortic valve. Now, one could argue that this angle is not perfect, which it isn't, but it's kind of the best that we've got with toe. 
So we can use this to try and interrogate aortic stenosis and things like that, but just bear in mind that I'd normally use my uh, color Doppler box to try and figure out exactly which direction of the blood flow is going in. And I reckon I can tell myself that blood flow is going in that direction. And that means that if I put my continuous wave Doppler on it, I'm, I'm, I'm off a little bit. And that means that I'm gonna underestimate, uh, I'm gonna underestimate exactly what it is that I'm looking for. Uh, does that make sense? Absolutely. So I can try and get the best angle I can. So it's a great question from Louise about trying to manipulate the, the probe so that you're in the best angle possible. Absolutely. But the only way I can manipulate it is by sort of twisting from side to side, okay, twisting my hand around. So you try and absolutely, you're going to try and optimize it as best you can. But it's not like I'm, I guess I'm trying to say you can't exactly sort of go off axis like you can when you're looking for when you've got a transthoracic. So just bear in mind, I often find that we sort of underestimate flows with toe. Okay, so that's the tip and the trick for the deep gastric view is, uh, which I think is probably the hardest view to get, get a short axis view, keep advancing till you can't see it anymore, then you do your full anti-flexion, and then you pull it back against the, the heart, trying to find it in there. Okay. The next one to try and get is the one that we, I don't know if I'm going to be able to show as well. So I'm just going to quickly show this view here, which we, which is a bit of an advanced view. So this is for, again, this is for those doing uh, sort of the DDU exams. This is a bit of an advanced view, but it's, so it's zero degrees. And if I do full, if I do a bit of anti-flexion, and I do a little bit of lateral rotation while I'm in my deep gastric view, I can get a good look. I'll try and get a bit better. You can get a view down here where I look at what's these valves that I'm seeing here? Um, Lewis, may you've just we've just done that. What, what are the valves that I can see in this image here? So you've got the mitral on the right of the screen and the right tricuspid there, yep. on the left. And then we've got a tricuspid on the left. And you'll see they're both sort of like this on face view or on fast view. Uh, yeah. Worth having a look that the anterior uh, mitral valve leaflet here is much bigger than the posterior mitral valve leaflet. And uh, if you can see the cusps a bit better, what cusp is my uh, what cusp is my um, uh, cursor on there? Anterior. One, two, or three. Oh, uh, we're at the back. Or the. It's from. Front. So, yeah, sorry. Uh, nice. So A1, A1. Beautiful. So A1, because let's not forget, we're obviously imaging posteriorly. We all go to transthoracic, first of all, but uh, we're, we're imaging from the back of the probe. So, we, oh, sorry, back of the patient. So this is always inferior up here. So this would be A3 and P3. This would be anterior here with the A1 and P1 like that. Beautiful. And then what's this valve? Tricuspid. Beautiful. And we've got three cusps here. I'll try and show as best I can. Three cusps here. You've got the one that's next door to the septum is called the septum. septum. And then you've got the one at the front is anterior and the one at the back is posterior. Okay. It's a fairly useless view for looking at the tricuspid valve, but it looks really pretty, I think. Uh, so we can't really analyze the valve very well with this, but yeah, it's the only way we can have a really good look at that valve in so the on fast plane. But then the, the one that I'm trying to show you, the, the good view here is that it's one of the best ways we have of analyzing the RVOT. So we can put a pulse wave Doppler, um, Bob won't show you much here, but you can put it down through here and we can get our RVOT flows through that. And this is one of the most useful angles if we can for trying to assess for things like looking for the flying W sign or the pulmonary acceleration time or trying to analyze for pulmonary hypertension. If you're doing that, that's quite a good one to try and look for, okay? Yep. So you go full anti-flexion. And then I also, in a, in a real person, it doesn't work brilliantly, Bob, but in, so full anti-flexion, and then you do the other wheel in completely the opposite direction. Uh, sorry if that's not showing. So I'm pulling down on that. I don't know if you guys can see this. I pull down on that for full anti-flexion. You turn the other wheel in the other direction, and then I just put my 
thumb on both of them, locking them in that position. Okay. And in Bob, I've got to pull them back a tiny bit, but that sort of works. It's, it's normally sort of a bit more of a deep sort of gastric level, sort of upper gastric level. I find that it works, but you get a view that looks like that. Okay. So it's almost like an it's almost like an RV sort of inflow view almost, sort of. But it's just the best view for having a look at that pulmonary valve. Okay. All right. So that's deep gastric. Bit of an extra, a bit of an advanced one to have a look at that pulmonary valve. And then pulling back the probe, we then get our short axis view. And you can look at the apex, mid, and base of the heart. And very rarely does it look absolutely perfect like this, of course. Okay, so regional wall motion abnormalities you can get from this. So let's just pause at this for a second. Who's next on the list? Uh, should we try sit and list? The Darwin guys, are you, are you happy to have a crack at this next one? So we got a short axis view here, right? Can you see my cursor? What, what wall is this? What segment is this of the heart? So this segment here. So from our short axis level, uh, short axis level, uh, mid papillary muscle, which one is this? You've got Inferior. So we have anteroceptal, infraceptal, anterolateral, infralateral, anterior and inferior. Which one is it? Inferior. Very nice. Inferior. So inferior, back of the probe, inferior, anterior, anteroceptal, anterolateral, infralateral, infraceptal. Very nice. Okay, so the short axis level, I then go up to 90 degrees. And we can have a look at sort of the long axis views of side on. And this is quite a nice one for having a look for wall hypertrophy, trying to see if there's any uh, apical clot or anything like that. And we're looking down that heart, uh, cutting it so down the long axis. So again, which wall is this? It'll be inferior one. Very nice. And this one here will be the anterior. Very cool. Nice one. Okay. I can. That's when I've got the LV in the middle of my screen, because whatever was in the middle of my screen on that plane remains in the middle of my screen when I come up to 90 degrees, right? And now if I want to go and have a look at the right side of the heart, I just do my clockwise rotation and I can look round to the other side of the heart. And what we can have a look see through here, now we can see that tricuspid valve and then this is sort of, maybe this is a bit more of an RV inflow view. So you've got the, the right ventricle down at the bottom of the screen. Sorry, trying to do two things at once. The right ventricle there and the right atrium up there. So we could put our color Doppler on and try and see if there's any regurgitation in there. Okay. So again, for the, when we're in the uh, short axis view, I go short axis, then I go to 90 degrees. I look on the left side and I look on the right side. So yeah, short axis up to 90 degrees, and I look left, uh, look left and then look right, okay? The next thing we can do is go up to 120 degrees, and what I'm trying to get here is a view through the aortic valve, to try and get that second bite of the cherry of trying to have a look at flows through the uh, aortic valve, so we're a little bit off the screen. You get the idea. What, uh, so let's say I got values through that aortic valve that were close to, uh, you know, three meters a second. Is that uh, going to tell me that I've got moderate stenosis? If you had that value, would you be happy just to say, uh, so Danielle, let's ask you this one. So we think someone's got a bit of a thickened aortic valve. I do this view here and I get a value of three meters per second. Are you happy calling that uh, moderate aortic stenosis? No, I'd say that a value of three with that um, projection that you have there is almost certainly an underestimate because that's yes. the beam is almost perpendicular to flow through the aortic valve. Thank you very much. And that's not just because I'm rubbish at doing toe. It's no. often just because that's the best view that we've got, which I think um, maybe that sort of brings to that point where if we're talking about valvular analysis with toe, I think you've, it's the same as a transfer, you've just got to use every single piece of information you've got because I guess particularly the Doppler views, the Doppler views are, are rarely absolutely perfect. Uh, so we've got to use our 
you know, 2D and uh, all other views that we possibly can. Okay. Um, all right, so let's get rid of that. Okay, so after our short access view, we're gonna come back up and make it the general four chamber view. That's the view we probably all, all know the, the chambers here. So we've got the left atrium, right atrium, right ventricle, uh, left ventricle. Um, I can put flow here through my tricuspid and aortic valve. One of the things for me with the tricuspid valve is that you very rarely, uh, so I'll just try and get a nice view. You very rarely get a beautiful angle with your tricuspid valve here. You know, if you've got tricuspid regurge, it, it's normally sort of in that direction. And so if I'm trying to cut that angle, I, I often feel like I'm at least 30 degrees out. We'll, we'll do it. It's just, again, we've got to understand that we're probably going to underestimate the, uh, underestimate the profile. Um, what else are we going to look at? Why don't we, we talk a little bit about the mitral valve? I'll, I'll, so when we get mitral valve prolapses, and I'm sorry, Bob's not brilliant at showing these sort of individually. Let's just start with, who else have we got here? Benny, you're with us. But Benny, tell us what valves on this mitral valve, which one's anterior, which one's posterior, and how do you tell? Uh, sorry. Sorry, what was the question? <laughs> you've got, have you got the newest recruit for DDU teaching there? Is that Jasper in the, in the picture? Listening very hard. <laughs> well done, Jasper. I've your first echo tutorial. I feel very privileged yes. to be... Uh, early. That's how long it takes. <laughs> <laughs> um, there'll be a cardiologist probably. Um, yeah, just uh, just tell me how we're going to just talk a little bit about the mitral valve. Which leaflet is that one there, and which leaflet is that one there, and how do you how do you tell? Uh, so the first one you pointed to is the anterior leaflet. Yeah, and and I, how do you know that's anterior? I, well, the way I think about it, I don't know if this is the best way. Is can you? You kind of think that you're going to go into a, four, uh, a five chamber view. You're kind of close to it. And the aorta, aortic valve is always anterior. So Beautiful. the leaflet next to the aortic valve is going to be the anterior leaflet. So I really would... nice, really nice, really nice trick. So your thing is, is that the aortic valve is always right next to the anterior one. If I pull my probe up a little bit, the aortic valve comes into the picture. And so you always know that that's the anterior. Nice. I've always, uh, the way that I've always done it is, um, I know that the heart sort of curves over, so the right ventricle is not really the right ventricle. We call it the anterior ventricle, and uh, and the and the septum therefore is always at the front of the heart. So I sort of have the one that's close to the septum is normally the anterior one. But I think I prefer your way of being next door to the aortic valve. That's a bit better. So yeah, we always know that that's the anterior leaflet, and that means that the other one's always the posterior leaflet. It's also the smaller one. So the posterior one's a bit smaller than the anterior. Um, uh, and I might, shall I just quickly tell you my cheats method for knowing about the leaflets? Um, so this is probably not perfect. I'm just gonna come in close to the screen for this one. So if you take your hand, uh, I'll try and do it around like this way. If I take my left hand and you hold it up in front of your face and you've got to have it so that it's uh, also the bottom part of your thumb is just a little bit over to your, to your, to your finger there, okay? And hold it in front of your hand so that's a little bit of, and that's the mitral valve. And the anterior leaflet is there and the posterior leaflet is there. And zero degrees is the horizon, all right? So then when we come around to 90 degrees, it's using your right hand then, that's zero degrees. So that's if you want to as well. And then you come around there. It's Dan, down. the sound keeps dropping out while you're talking when you're not looking in this direction. Sorry, what keeps dropping out? The the sound. Oh, I'm sorry. So is that better if I sit like that? Is that better? Uh, it sounds so. Good. I'll, I'll give it a go. Okay, so I'll try and hold my hand like this and stand with my face too close to it. So sorry. that's the C shape. Your right hand is then the zero degrees. I might get a ruler. Hang on a second. Then if you imagine my, my hand, at is zero degrees, okay? So that means what we're looking at right there on Bob. There, okay, so zero degrees, mid-esophageal view. I'm looking through the mitral valve like that. So this is the anterior, this is the posterior. So when I'm cutting through there, I know I'm going through sort of A2, P2. 
All right. When I come around to 90 degrees, like that view there, see if I actually pause that. Okay, so there we go, anterior valve, posterior valve, zero degrees, let's do it like that. 90 degrees is now through it like that. Maybe a pen will be better. Sorry if this is, I'm just obviously making this up a little bit. So zero degrees, a pen like this. So I should be looking here. This is the inferior wall, and that's the anterior wall. So I'm looking at, so this one would be P1, A2, P3. Cool. Zero degrees. 90 degrees. P1, A2, P3. And that's what it looks like a trap door that's coming up in the middle. Last view is coming down to 120. Sorry, can't multitask. Just recap again. So there's zero degrees, 90 degrees, and then 120 is one like that. So again, looking through A2 and P2 or P3. So depending on your angle. We'll, we'll go through that maybe when we talk about mitral regurg a bit more, but here you can see the big valve next door to the aortic valve is. Uh, is the anterior one, and if we're off at that angle there, we've got to be A2 and P2 or P3. So that's just the real cheats way, quick way of talking about valve leaflet primer. Um, any 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 thoughts on that? I don't know if anyone does. Anyone else has got any sort of tips and tricks? Okay. Uh, so here we go. For, so there's our mid-esophageal four-chamber view. You can look at the left ventricle, the right ventricle, tricuspid valve, mitral valve. I bring the mitral valve into the middle of the screen and I start rotating around to 60 degrees, so the two-chamber view. I'll just show that one more time to see how, you could, uh, see how we go. So you can see zero degrees. LV, middle of the screen, a little bit of rotation. Then I've got the omniplane coming down to 60 degrees. That's what gives us our two chamber view. We can come up to 90 degrees for sort of true commissural view. P1, A2, P3. And there's the Try and do it. Uh, Lewis, which was this? Oh, sorry, Lewis McLean. So I'll just to unmute myself. Oh, uh, cool, man. Uh, so that's the inferior wall. That's yeah, the cool, inferior. Size, uh, and that's the anterior come, wall. And come around to 120. So this is like our, uh, probably a bit more like that. So this is the equivalent of a parasternal long axis, I guess. So what wall is that and what wall is that? So it's the antraceptal on the right and the inferior lateral on the left. You don't know. Uh, after I've looked through that, you know, you can focus in on all the different valves depending on how you go. I come down to 110 and that's where I can have a look at this little nubbin in here, the left atrial appendage, which we can zoom in on. And um, I guess maybe talk a little bit about color here, okay? so. When I put color over one of these guys, it often you can't see any flow, and that's because we're looking for a low flow state, right? So when we're particularly looking for like for patent foramen ovales or ASDs or pulmonary vein flow or uh, or left atrial appendage flow, we've got to use 
you've got to turn down your scale. Uh, I'm sorry, I think all of our faces might be hiding this other way. So here you can see my flows are at 70. I'd actually probably be wanting to turn that down so I can, if I turn my, here I can see my Doppler colors at 70. I'd have it closer down to 35 and that would help me see flow that's starting to come into areas like the left atrial appendage. When we're trying to do it for the valves, you have it close to like 65 or 70 because you're looking at higher speed flows, obviously. But low flow states have your scale close to 35 or 40. And from here, just above it, just above it, we can start to see the left upper pulmonary vein in there. And what I might do is I sort of I try and find the entrance to it and just start rotating around a little bit, trying to find something like that. You see that 90 degrees or so, that's when I start to see I've got a decent angle down through that left upper pulmonary vein. You see, I'm just looking at that left upper pulmonary vein there. After I've analyzed that one with pulse wave Doppler, you can maybe change the angle a little bit, coming down close to, normally it's best better than 40, I think. And we can try and get the best angle we possibly can through there. And this is the hardest one. I find the left lower pulmonary vein super hard to get to, but you sort of get the idea that then they're about maybe, the angle difference between those two is about so 50 degrees normally. So if you find the left upper, come down about say 30, 40 degrees and start fishing around through there and just push the probe just in a little bit and change the angle of interrogation and hopefully you find it in there. Bob makes it look ridiculously easy. Uh, I'm sure those of you who are doing some tone know it's not that straightforward sometimes. Okay. So after you've done the after you've done the left atrial appendage in the um, uh, after you've done the left atrial appendage in the pulmonary vein, I come back to my midesophageal forte view at zero degrees. I pull it back until that aortic valve comes in. I'm going to try and find the short axis of that aortic valve. So come up to 30, pull it back a tiny bit, and there's the aortic valve sitting in there. Bob's sort of more like 40 or so, and you get that beautiful sort of three three leaflets opening up there. And you can see the tricuspid valve on this side where you can again put color Doppler and try and have a look through that, uh, as well as the uh, pulmonary valve, if I just change the angle a little bit. The pulmonary valve sort of comes in wrapped around underneath it. So the short axis sometimes not great in Bob. Okay. And after that, one of the last little views is coming around to 110 degrees. And I look over to the patient's right. And um, what's this called? Lee, are you starting off doing toe? Do you know about toe? Lee, can you hear me, buddy? Hello? I can what's this? Hear you. Uh, yeah. Do you know what I, this view's called? Because uh, what I should be seeing is the superior vena cava here. Uh, is it meant to be a bicaval? Yeah, very nice, very nice. Bob's actually, uh, it's normally 110 on people. Bob's a bit more like sort of 90 or so. If I can try and find it properly. Maybe a little bit less. So what I'm trying to get is that. Trying to get that kind of view. So you've got the SBC at the right here. So yeah, Oli, tell me how SBC there, what's this one? Uh, the right atrium. Beautiful, and that thing, that line, squiggly line coming in there? Meant to be the IVC. Beautiful, and you normally got the left atrial appendage, uh, left uh, atrium at the top, and this is normally quite a good view looking for patent frame and ovales. Hmm. Um, and so it's really nice to have a look at the SBC through this view, because you can have a look with M mode, and you can get an idea of collapsibility. And if you've got your patient who's Mechanically ventilated, fully mechanically ventilated. You've got a collapse of the SVC by more than 36%, they say, with insufflation. That's suggested of being fluid responsiveness. And arguably, they say, according to the evidence, that's the best one for looking at uh, uh, fluid responsiveness. Is it collapsibility or distensibility? 
collapsibility, SBC collapsibility. So every time it collapses down. Um, they don't really have a distensibility index for the SVC. That's normally with the IVC. Uh, and I guess more used on the spontaneously breathing patient. But yeah, so it's all, it's all about the, the, the collapse with underfilled patients during insufflation. This, this view here, though, 90 degrees, is probably the best one. If you just look over to that patient's left a little bit, from the, so from the SVC, IVC view, the bicable view, over to the patient's left a little bit, this gives you the best angle for interrogating the tricuspid valve, I reckon. So this one, if you stick your color off, uh, if you stick your continuous wave Doppler down through there, it sort of gives you the best angle for regurg. All right, so the best angle for the pulmonary valve analysis is sort of in a deep gastric, uh, deep gastric view. And the best analysis of the tricuspid valve is at this short axis level at 90 degrees. Okay, just in the meaning of time, I'm just going to show you just another couple of, another little tip and trick. So if you come down to zero, and I find that aortic valve, as I pull it up, I can start to see the pulmonary valve come in. All right? And if I pull the whole probe back a tiny bit and then retroflex, I can get this view as best I can down through that main pulmonary artery, which is this one just here. So this is probably the best view that we've got for having a look at the saddle PEs. And it also gives us an, another idea of interrogating the main pulmonary artery, looking for our Doppler profile uh, of blood coming out of here. So I, I can use this to try and find that like flying W sign for, uh, for pulmonary hypertension, uh, acceleration time and things like that. I try and put that cursor, obviously, the other side of the pulmonary valve if I can. All right. And then I finish it off by trying to find the aorta. So there's the aorta. I find the aorta on the right side of the screen, left side of the patient. And I just follow it down. So I keep pushing in the probe, keep pushing in the probe, keeping that aorta in the middle of the screen until I lose it. Zoom in on it a bit. And then I just pull it up and out keeping it in the middle of my screen as I go. As it curves over to the other side, I'll increase my depth. I can have a look at the arch, the blood vessels coming off it. There's the ascending aorta, and you're done. So that's sort of the whole toe probe, I guess in the many of time, we'll probably call it quits at that one. Um, um, I, I hope that was useful. So I know it's probably a massive amount of uh, revision for most of you because you're doing a lot of toe, but I hope it gives you an idea of, uh, you know, of how to do a toe study, what we're looking for. And again, it's, I, I'm doing it at the same time every, every time, just like I'm doing the transthoracic every time, just to try and get the systematic approach so you're not missing stuff, good analysis of the LV and RV from all different angles and not missing a valvular problem or something. Um, so I guess that's it. Are there any thoughts or any questions, particularly from those of you who are doing a bit more toe than, than the others? Any golden Sam, tips? I had a question. Sure. Uh, uh, what can we do to reduce the complications, uh, you know, especially reducing trauma to the esophagus? What so, precautions can we I guess, first of all, it's sort of patient selection. And I don't think we should be doing these unless we have to. Um, I think maybe that would differ slightly from our European colleagues who are doing, uh, they, they do these on all their mechanically ventilated patients, for example, they don't do a lot of transthoracic sometimes. So I think would say that the, the first thing would be you just do it on the right patient. Uh, before you stick the toe probe down, you've got to make sure that they have not uh, ever had surgery before. If they've had an endoscopy before, what did it show? You know, I'm happy to do a toe if it's shown that there was, you know, a little bit of you know erosive disease or it was a little bit of Barrett's esophagus you know that maybe that's okay as long as it's been well treated but if they've got any kind of strictures I'm really nervous if they've got a massive hiatus hernia I don't push the probe too much I'll still do it with the hiatus hernia but I don't go don't go crazy uh, if they've got if they've had any kind of surgery or they've had bariatric surgery I, I don't do toes really uh, and 
I, I have done it once, but that was under the very strict guidance of the gastro the gastroenterologist who said it was you know, okay to do it. So I think choosing the right patients and anyone who's had, uh, you know, anyone who's got um, uh, varices or things like that, I don't do toes on. And then, then the next thing is drugs. So if they've been on a lot of steroids or if they're over the age of 80, I've, someone's got to really try and persuade me hard to do a toe. Um, because the, the population that's most been affected by this in, in the big trials are those who are old, uh, so over 80, and are on steroids. And then the last thing, as I said, was the bisphosphonate. So it's just choosing your cohort wisely, and then it's about the experience of the user. And in, in, in our center here, the problems that we've had is in people who are sort of at that 25 to 50 mark in their toes. So not super experienced, but you know, having a go at inserting them. And uh, I think, you know, if, if you're at that stage of your training, you just got to stay humble, right? I think that's the same with most things that we're doing. Um, yes, yeah, so that's probably the best. Maybe, uh, maybe there's one more thing is that, um, I know something I haven't told you. On the toe probe, the one thing that's missing on Bob, the simulator, is the lock. So normally on, on the proper probe, there'd be a little bar sitting out there, which is the lock. I never use that, I've never used it under any circumstances at all. They use it in uh, maybe cardiac anesthesia, um, but I think make sure that is off at all times. If it is on, that's when the toe probe, well, you know, you can have it in full anti-flexion and pulling that in and out of a, uh, of a patient's esophagus can be really dangerous. So I, uh, that's just maybe the last tip and trick. Does, does that help, uh, Ravi? Is, do you use a laryngoscope uh, routinely for insertion? No, I, I routinely, so I use a laryngoscope to get myself out of trouble if I can't insert it in a, uh, in a, in a mechanically ventilated patient. Most of the time, I think it's essential that you at least have it like by the patient's feet to ward off evil spirits. And normally I find that if I've got the laryngoscope out, I don't have to use it. But uh, every time I've had to use one, I've had to go away and get it and bring it back. So yeah, I always have it at the patient's feet to, to ward off evil spirits. Thanks. Thanks, Sam. Do you have any do you have any concerns using the deep transgastric views in patients with reduced sphincter blood flow, so high dose vasopressors? Well well I do now. Yeah. Uh, oh. yeah uh, <laughs> no, I mean it's it's the best view that we've got for for looking at the aortic valve. So maybe I should say that if, if, if the aortic valve isn't sort of a major part of this, you know, if it's not a major thing, I'll have a go at the gastric view, but I won't push it. You know, if we're looking for, in fact, if we're looking at a valve analysis, like a prosthetic valve being analyzed or effective endocarditis, I might push it a little bit more. You just gotta be careful, you know, I still think, you know, I've never, I've never seen the, most of the esophageal perforations seem to sort of happen up here. It's not really the gastric perforations that happen uh, according to the literature, but maybe we should just say, you've got to be careful. And the deep gastric view is the hardest. It's the most uncomfortable for the patient. But most of the damage I think is done in the, in the esophageal, in the esophagus. It's esophageal ruptures, not gastric ruptures that are the problem with both. Thanks. All right, well, uh, thanks guys. Well, we might call it a day there. If there are those of you who want to go through your written exams, we'll go through that now, but maybe I'll stop the recording now. And uh, if you'd like to hang around, you're more than welcome. Otherwise, I'll see you a little bit later, okay? Thanks guys.